Welcome back, everyone, to Constructive Uncoupling, the podcast devoted to amicable divorces. I'm Judith Weigel, your host and amicable divorce expert. Why? Because that's all I do, amicable divorces. Topic for today, the power of denial. We all go into denial. Whenever we want to avoid reality as a defense mechanism, we go into denial if we want to believe somebody beyond what we know to be true. Outside of divorce, I just ran into a situation where somebody I knew was married for 35 years. In those 35 years, She gave her paycheck to her husband every week to deposit. That was his job in the marriage, to deposit the paycheck. What she never did, unfortunately, was put her name on the account. So fast forward 35 years later, he's in his last year of life, her husband, married 35 years, and she says to him a few weeks before his death, I think we should really look at all of our accounts and see what we have that needs to be straightened out or organized just so everything works smoothly, you know, once the transition happens. He said, no, you'll be very surprised at what you get once I'm dead. Okay, let's stop right there. You'll be very surprised at what you get when I'm dead. Why would anybody be surprised of anything if you're married 35 years? In 35 years, everybody should know what's going on. You should all know what the wills are made up of, the content of the wills, who has the wills, is the attorney still living, has it been updated every couple of years? She went into the bank where they had the one big account a week before he died and found out It wasn't a joint account. It was just his account that she had been giving her paychecks to. She wasn't even the beneficiary. His children from a different marriage were the beneficiaries. She came home and said, I was just at the bank. This isn't a joint account. And the account had close to half a million dollars in it. And he said to her, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. It's a joint account. They don't know. They're crazy. I'm fine. I know what I'm talking about. He passed away, and within 24 hours, half a million dollars was wired to the beneficiaries, the children. She got nothing, and there's nothing she could do. The power of denial inside of a marriage. So let's look at the power of denial in all the different aspects of relationship. First of all, the decision to marry. Are you choosing the right person? Is your gut telling you there's something going on that is making you a little uncomfortable that you're still going to marry anyway? Why do we marry the wrong person? Why? Well, we marry the wrong person for a few different reasons. A, we just simply want to get married. We're too old. We've passed our goal. Everybody else has gotten married in our friend circle. And we just want this person to be right. Maybe this person has a lot of money, and that's what we really want. But just the decision to marry, it starts right there. In fact, I've had several people who have come to my office to divorce, and they have said, That on the wedding day, something happened, either domestic abuse, either they were hurt, physically hurt, or yelled at. Something happened either the day before or the day of the wedding. And they were given the opportunity to not get married by, if a parent was uh, uh, funding the cost of the wedding. I've seen people that their parents have said, don't get married. If you're not sure, don't do it. It doesn't matter. The money doesn't matter. It's okay. We'll have a party. We'll celebrate the fact that you made a good decision, that you didn't marry in denial. And it's a very hard decision. When that happens on the day of your wedding, think about that. All of your emotions. You know, maybe you know internally in your gut this is the wrong person. You've had arguments. They've had uh, expressed anger. 
when they should never have expressed anger and weird things happening. Their behavior isn't right, but yet we still want to make nice. This is the person we feel we should marry. We really want to get married. So we marry and you end up getting divorced, of course. How about during the marriage? So many different signs, like domestic violence. Why are women especially, it's not that men are not the products of domestic violence, but women especially, why do we try and make it right and wash away domestic violence? There's no reason to hit you. There is no reason for anybody to lash out and hit another person. I mean, I know we get crazy angry sometimes, all of us, and we want to stamp our feet and pound our fist, but that's different than hitting somebody, than laying our hands on somebody. And those who are products of domestic violence repeatedly, if you don't stop it the second it happens, the very first time you experience domestic violence, if you don't stop it right then and there and either say counseling is our next step or we don't have a relationship or simply get out, that's a really strong power of denial and it doesn't lead anywhere good. Domestic violence has no good ending to it. No happy ending on domestic violence. How about the decision to have children? Your relationship isn't going well, but you think by having children, it'll make you stronger. Wrong, wrong, and wrong. No. When we have children, it tests our relationship. It doesn't make it stronger if it's not a good relationship to begin with. It tests our relationship. I had a couple here that I actually asked the man, the father, if he really wanted to have children because he wasn't behaving normally. We were in a mediation. We were looking at the co-parenting schedule and based on the co-parenting schedule, then you establish child support and he just wasn't wanting any time with his son. And so I just asked, did you even want to have children? It doesn't sound like you want to spend time? He said, no, I never wanted children. She thought we should have a child because our relationship wasn't going well. And now they're getting divorced and he didn't want to be a dad and oh, well, he is. And now you can't force somebody to be a dad. So how many divorces have I done in which I could tell that at least the father did not want to be a dad? and was giving up a lot of co-parenting time, and therefore, oh, and not wanting to spend money. Some want to spend money just to not be around the children. Some don't want to spend money and don't want to be around the children. And then I get calls after the divorce is final saying, I can't get him, and it's generally him, I'm so sorry, guys. It's generally him. I can't get him to spend more time around the children. And my only thing to say is that that's what he said in the mediation. He didn't want to spend time. You forced him to spend time. Now what's going to happen? This is a really tough call for a mom. What do you do? You do your best you can. You do the best you can at being everything to your children. You just do the best you can. You can't really speak down about the other parent because that wouldn't be good because kids always want to have relationship with their, relationships with their parents. You know, at some point, maybe not. But when they're younger, they struggle to want to. Even if they know their parent isn't great, it's still their parent. So be very careful when you have, make the decision to have children. Don't go in denial that it's going to save the relationship because it won't ever save the relationship. It'll make it worse. Ah, and then there's the decision to divorce. Going into denial that divorce is or is not the right thing to do. Acceptance of the divorce. Thinking that, okay, we'll just start the divorce, but no, I still have high hopes that we're going to stay married. I hear that more times than I thought I would hear that. And you know what? I understand that. 
I understand that somebody wants to hold out until the very, 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 very last second when, okay, I guess we are going to get divorced. I understand that. But it makes it very hard to go through the divorce process. It makes it very hard to go through the legal divorce process, the filing steps, because you're pulling that person tooth and nail to get them to fill out forms, address making decisions. But accepting the decision to divorce, that is just so very hard if you don't want to be divorced. And then the decision to remarry. Think about that. Now you've just gone through a divorce and it was painful. They're all painful. Okay, maybe they're not all painful. Maybe there is that 5% of the people that are so happy they're getting divorced that they, it's the best thing that ever happened to them. They finally got themselves to the point of saying, okay, it's time we got to do it. Yeah, they've gone through the emotional divorce. Um, And so going through the legal divorce is just phenomenal. They can't get their forms done fast enough. Well, I kind of love those people, to be honest with you. It makes my life easier to go through the divorce faster. But let's talk about denial. So now those are all the reasons and the um, aspects of when the power of denial comes into your life. Now, let's just talk about denial when it helps and when it hurts. But let's define denial. Denial is a coping mechanism that gives you time to adjust to distressing situations. But staying in denial can interfere with treatment or your ability to tackle challenges. Now, this is from the Mayo Clinic. I have downloaded a few articles and I wanted to share them with you. If you're in denial... You're trying to protect yourself by refusing to accept the truth about something that's happening in your life, and obviously something that's happening that isn't so good. In some cases, initial short-term denial can be a good thing, giving you time to adjust to a painful or stressful issue. It might also be a precursor to making some sort of change in your life. But denial has a dark side. Let's explore. Understanding denial and its purpose. Refusing to acknowledge that something is wrong is a way of coping with emotional conflict, with stress, painful thoughts, threatening information, and anxiety. You can be in denial about anything that makes you feel vulnerable or threatens your sense of control. Ah, control. When you go, this is me, when you go in denial, you give up control. You literally give up control when you go in denial. Now, denial is a little bit of a vacation. I want to go in denial that life exists sometimes. I mean, it gets so crazy, right? <laughs> we, we are in 2021, and we've gone through a lot, and it's only March. We've gone through a lot in 2021, have we not? If you're living in the United States, you know what I mean. So. We can take a little vacation from uh, reality, but we do give up control, such as, back to the article, illness, addiction, an eating disorder, personal violence, financial problems, or relationship conflicts. You can be in denial about something happening to you or to someone else. Aha. You can go in denial that something is wrong with your spouse. You may be fine. And you too still may be in love, but I don't know, like addiction, something like that. When you're in denial, you, A, won't acknowledge a difficult situation, B, try not to face the facts of a problem, and C, when you're in denial, you downplay possible consequences of the issue. And denial has its consequences. It really does. When denial can be helpful, so the Mayo Clinic goes on to say, refusing to face facts might seem unhealthy. Sometimes, though, a short period of denial can be helpful. Being in denial gives your mind the opportunity to unconsciously absorb shocking or distressing information at a place, at a pace that won't send you into a psychological tailspin. For example, 
After a traumatic event, you may need some, you may need, I'm sorry, you might need several days or weeks to process what's happened and come to grips with the challenges ahead. Imagine what might happen if you find a lump in your throat. You might feel a rush of fear and adrenaline as you imagine it's cancer. So you ignore the lump, hoping it'll go away on its own. But when the lump is still there a week later, you consult your doctor. This type of denial is a helpful response to stressful information. You initially de denied the stressful problem, the distressing problem, but as your mind absorbed the possibility, you began to approach the problem more rationally and took action by seeking help. When denial can be harmful. But what if you had continued to be in denial about the lump? What if you never sought help? If denial persists and prevents you from taking appropriate action, such as consulting your doctor, it's a harmful response. So consider these examples of unhealthy denial. A college student witnesses a violent shooting that claims not to be affected by it. The partner of an older man in the end stage of life refuses to discuss health care directives and wills with him insisting that he's getting better or knowing that you have a half million dollars in a bank account and your name's not on it and it's half your money. Heavy duty denial. God, my heart goes out to her. I can't tell you how I think about that every single day. Uh, that is just so seriously the power of denial. Someone periodically misses morning work meetings after drinking excessively the night before, but insists there's no problem because the work is still getting done. That's a functional alcoholic, by the way. A couple are ringing up so much credit card debt that they toss the bills aside because they can't bear to open them. Okay, so... A couple that I had, many couples have come here that have had serious debt, so much debt that child and spousal support couldn't be paid because just paying the minimum on most of the debt, can't even pay the minimum on all the debt, absorbs all the money. And you know, it's interesting because you kind of know you're seriously living outside of your means, but then when you go to get divorced, the person who does not have the credit card debt or the, the financial issues, will generally say, I had no idea it was that bad. I had no idea it was that bad. Well, what is that bad? I mean, did you already know you were living outside your means, right? Why? Because you see your spouse getting loans from relatives and friends. Okay, that means you're living outside your means. So maybe you don't know the full extent, but even knowing 50% of the extent is bad enough, and now you can't get child and spousal support because that debt, if you're not going to declare bankruptcy, which bankruptcy kind of becomes an option at that point, if you're not going to declare bankruptcy, it's untenable. I can't tell you how many people, though, live beyond their means. It's a tough thing. going on. The parents of a teen with drug addiction, giving their child clothing money. Okay, so I would say that it takes a little bit of time to really grasp that your, your child's behavior is unusual and possibly there's a substance abuse issue because it just takes time to notice behavior changes. So that's okay. Don't beat yourself up for that. But definitely beat yourself up for when you really do know there's a problem and you don't want to do anything about it. I mean, you have to. You have to acknowledge it. Or my go-to extreme example, how, how do you think Ted Bundy's parents felt when they realized who Ted Bundy was? Mass murderer. I mean, think about it. People that commit high-level, grotesque crimes have parents. And what do these parents do when they have to recognize that their, their child is a, um, a danger to society, has hurt people, has killed people? I mean, this is a terrible thing. And then lastly, 
A person with chest pain and shortness of breath doesn't believe those symptoms signal a heart attack and delays getting help. Well, okay, so I have other examples. I get calls in the office. This is denial. And the person calling me has been served with divorce papers. Yet they're sobbing on the phone. I can't believe it. There's nothing wrong in our relationship. And then all of a sudden I get served divorce papers. So whenever I hear that, of course, I'm not going to argue with it. I don't know the person calling me. And I do realize they're under stress. So to, to argue them out of this or to question them about it is really counterproductive. The more I let them talk, the more they change their story. And all of a sudden, they've been to therapy a lot, trying to correct the relationship. Uh, They don't talk. They don't communicate. They don't have an intimate relationship. It, It comes out in the course of the conversation. So that person opened up the conversation with me with, I got served with divorce papers and I didn't see it coming. Okay, well, the shock that your spouse filed for divorce, totally understandable. Totally understandable. Because if you didn't talk about it before the filing, then you, you aren't working through this together. It's really not amicable. And when pop, people come to me and want to be the first ones that file, I can't really deny them the service But I am telling you, when I have to serve the other person, introduce myself, and try and engage them in this process that I offer, which is a filing service at a much reduced rate than going to an attorney to file, you know, if you can work out your settlement and use an attorney on the side for legal advice, that's fabulous. Then you you minimize your financial outlay, yet you get the best of both worlds. You get somebody filing for you at a much reduced cost, and you get to use an attorney to help you along the way making decisions. Yes, it's shocking if you don't know your spouse is filing for divorce, but you did know you had a problem. And so that's kind of a hybrid I guess, situation where you are in shock that you've just been served, but you know you had a bad relationship. Listen, with me, I knew our relationship wasn't right. I I mean, I knew that, and I expected that we would have to address it. When I was told that he wanted a divorce, I went into panic and shock mode. I didn't argue him out of it because, well, I knew we didn't have a great relationship. And I think underneath it, maybe I thought that we were great friends and we had a lot of fun dating, but maybe this wasn't the right relationship after being in the marriage for eight years. It just wasn't the right relationship. We didn't feed each other emotionally, psychologically. You know, in the daily course of life, because we hadn't seen each other. So there's just all sorts of little um, forms of denial. But to stay in denial is the problem. So temporary denial, fine. Permanent denial, not very healthy or good. So moving past denial. When faced with overwhelming turn of events, it's okay to say, I just can't think about all of this right now. You might need time to work through what's happened and adapt to new circumstances. There you go. But it's important to realize that denial should only be a temporary measure. It won't change the reality of a situation. It isn't always easy to tell if denial is holding you back. The strength of denial can change over time, especially for someone with chronic illness. Some periods are linked to less defensiveness. And at other times, denial may be stronger. Well, you know, a bad marriage is like a chronic illness. I mean, really it is. Every day is painful. If you feel stuck or if someone you trust suggests that you're in denial, however, you might try these strategies. Honestly examine what you fear. 
Think about the potential negative consequences of not taking action. Allow yourself to express your fears and emotions. Try to identify irrational beliefs about your situation. Journal about your experience. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of journaling because some people don't like it, and, and so I don't really say it a lot. And I don't know that I journal, but I do keep a journal and I write ideas down. But to journal your feelings every day, if you can do it, it actually is great. Because when you look back months later, you can actually see consistency in your thinking. And I always find that interesting. When, when you have consistency, you know you have something you need to deal with and something that's a part of your life. Let's see, open up to a trusted friend or loved one and participate in a support group. You know, they're not so bad, these support groups. I always thought they were, I don't know, too touchy-feely, but not really. I mean, literally listening to other people is wonderful because people will say things that in part could apply to you. If you can't make progress dealing with a stressful situation on your own, you're stuck in the denial phase. Consider talking to a mental health provider. He or she can help you find healthy ways to cope with the situation rather than trying to pretend it doesn't exist. And when a loved one needs help moving beyond denial, you might, you might find it frustrating when someone you love is in denial about an important issue. But before demanding that your loved one face the facts, take a step back. Try to determine if he or she just needs a little time to work through the issue. How about adultery? What if you know that a friend of yours is being cheated on by their spouse or serious partner? What do you do? That's a hard call. What do you do? Because you can maybe listen to that person, say, hey, something's weird, something doesn't make sense. What do you do? Do you step in? Do you not step in? Such a hard call. And then let's see, this is from Psychology Today, which is a little blurb. The concept of being in denial is often used as a value judgment, referring to the notion that a person is avoiding or negating reality. But what does being in denial really mean? The notion that one is in denial seems to have taken on a life of its own as an agent of many ills and as a catchphrase for people who dismiss the implications of their behavior. Although denial is considered to be a defense, it is a defense against reality. Although denial is considered to be an offense often used by people with addictive tendencies, its attributions reach beyond those struggling with substances. I know, when we talk about denial, it's so often about substance abuse, but honestly, being in denial about relationships is, I think, takes precedence because we're all in relationships, whether it's a marriage, a dating relationship, a family relationship, or a work relationship. We deny that we're in dead-end jobs. We just go to work and earn a paycheck. Denial is also attributed to people who do not want to acknowledge that bad stuff is occurring in their lives such as those who are attempting to cope with a tumultuous relationship. We can deny fact, deny responsibility, deny the impact of our actions, or deny what is really going on by hiding from our feelings. In any case, when we use denial to defend ourselves or cope with what we feel, we contradict the reality of a situation or attempt to adjust to a circumstance by neglecting its impact. Well, this thing about adultery is interesting because we eventually research it, don't we? We eventually really do want to know. And then when we know, what do we do with it? You're at a crossroads. 
you know, some people say, well, you know what, for the most part, the reality, uh, the, the relationship is fine. Where will I find anybody better than this person? Um, I can live with it. I've lived with it so far. People in Europe live with it. This is part of their lives. Very affluent people live with it to keep money in the family. They don't get divorced. They just have other relationships. You know, it just depends on what serves you. I guess that's the bottom line on everything. What actually serves you? You know, maybe accepting something that isn't so great serves you in ways that are quite beneficial. And so everything just has to come back to how do you make your life the best it can be? What people do you put in your life so that it can be the best it can be? What activities do you put in your life? What work do you put in your life? Okay, so here are some signs that you're in serious denial. You avoid talking about the issue. Well, especially if there's domestic violence. Avoiding talking about the issue is huge. Or if you have a partner that has substance abuse, I mean, that's a real hard conversation to have with them. But what if it's you? What if it's you that has substance abuse and you have children? And you really can't parent your children well because you're not there all the time. Or you're just not happy. Things have changed. No matter how you dodge the subject, a reluctance to face an issue head on, even in a simple conversation, is one of the leading signs that you might be in denial about your relationship. Number two, you can use other people's behaviors as evidence that you don't have a problem. Well, you can compare your relationship to other worse ones. You can do that and say, well, mine isn't so bad then. I mean, look at theirs. Look at Timmy and Renee. They fight all the time. At least we don't fight. Of course, we don't have sex. We don't talk. We don't eat together. We don't do anything together. But that's what people do. They look at other relationships that are worse and say, well, what the heck? Uh, number three, you promise future control to ward off concern. I'll speak about it later. I'll talk to him about it later. All right, I know there's a problem. He's got to know there's a problem too. We'll talk about it later. You know, there's never a right time. You know, the kids are always here. We're always running around. Yep. Because until you get control of whatever it is, you don't have control of your life. Number four, you deny a problem absolutely. We all know how common it is, common it is to overreact once someone strikes a nerve. When conversation turns to your perceived infidelity, so to speak, if you immediately react with emotional defensiveness, your response might be a clue that you really do have an issue. What's more, when, you're outright, when you outright deny behaviors that others have seen you engaged in firsthand, like adultery, it's likely that you may be either consciously or subconsciously trying to cover up hints at destructive patterns of behavior. Number five, you rationalize the issues. Well, even though we used to have sex a lot, and we really don't have sex anymore. Really? It is three or four times a year that bad? But neither do other couples, right? Again, comparing yourself to people who are worse. Number six, you blame others for your problem. Well, it's not really me. I'm affectionate, but they're not affectionate. I didn't have an affectionate family. So, therefore, I can't be expected to be affectionate. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're in a relationship and the other person wants to be affectionate, I think you have to step up to the affectionate plate. I think you have to figure out because that's part of being in a relationship. You have to have sex. You have to talk. You have to enjoy each other's company. You have to laugh together. If you don't have all of these aspects of a relationship, I mean, what do you really have? Number seven, you ignore the advice 
and concern of loved ones. I know it's annoying, isn't it? When people want to tell you what's wrong with your life. But we only want to tell each other what's wrong with our lives because we care. I mean, yes, you can say stop. I don't want to hear it anymore. I get it. But observers observe better than we admit reality. Number eight, you have stints of intimacy, but not not routine intimacy. Number nine, you engage in manipulative efforts like the vowel renewal. Okay, now this is interesting because on some of my most favorite reality TV episodes, like the Housewives of all these different cities, you know the relationship, the marriage is in trouble when you have a vowel renewal. Renewal. How many times have we seen vowel renewals on TV on these real Housewives of New York, New Jersey, Orange County. And as soon as the vowel renewal takes place, the divorce happens. Isn't that interesting? So when I see a vowel renewal, I'm like, oops, okay, end of that marriage. And then number 10, you consistently fall back on the it's my life defense. Our relationship is unique. Nobody understands our relationship but us. And here's what this particular article went on to say. The final cry of someone in denial who's run out of defenses, willingly and knowingly engaging in self-destructive behavior simply because it's your right to do so, is one of the most obvious signs of serious relationship disorder. You know there's a problem, but you just aren't going to deal with it. Now, lastly, be kind to yourself. So I found this article, ah, Mayo Clinic again. Be kind to yourself, how self-compassion can improve your resiliency. Self-compassion means accepting yourself as the imperfect person you are. It means being kinder to yourself and as a result, being kinder and more compassionate towards others. So if you are in denial, that you have issues in your relationship, you're really hurting yourself. And there's got to be something inside of you that makes you want to punish yourself. So what this Mayo Clinic article is talking about is get back to having compassion for yourself. Get back to wanting to have the best life you, life you can have and get back to understanding that you don't, that you've made decisions to give yourself a life that's no fun, that, that isn't feeding you, that isn't making you the best person that you can be. And we tend to put ourselves on the side burner. Too many things going on in our lives. We don't have the time for self-compassion. But as the article goes on, self-compassion means accepting yourself as the imperfect person you are. When you embrace the idea that you'll never be perfect, you can accept that mistakes are are an important part of your life's journey that contribute to who you are. Being kinder to yourself also boosts your resiliency and makes you kinder and more compassionate towards others. So let's see how this works with denial. When you're in denial, I think a little subtext of that is you're striving for the perfect relationship. And when you don't have the perfect relationship, you go in denial that you have an imperfect relationship. So when you go in denial that you have an imperfect relationship, there's really nothing to fix, yet there's a lot to fix. And what are we doing to ourselves? Why are we not being kind to ourselves? Why aren't we not putting ourselves first and say, wait a minute, you know, if I'm not happy, if if I'm not making choices that make me happy, what the heck am I doing? Why do I have this relationship if it's not enhancing me, if it's not making my life better? 
back to the article, the average adult brain creates approximately 70,000 thoughts each day. If you could pay attention to all of them, what would they say? Chances are your brain doesn't tell you how fantastic you look in those genes, how brilliant your presentation was, or what an amazing parent you are. That's not how your brain is designed. Your brain is designed to seek out threat, keep you safe from danger, and protect you. As a result, your brain focuses on the negative. It seeks out what's going wrong instead of what's right. It holds on to negative events and feelings more than positive ones. It tells you that if you were just this or that, if you could try a little harder, then things would be better. Okay, so with denial, you don't let your brain function well. You squash your gut. You squash, A, that your gut is telling you there's something wrong, and you squash when your brain wants to explore what's wrong. How can you counteract this natural tendency towards the negative, the article says? One answer is self-compassion. This takes intention and effort. Try these three key concepts identified by compassion researcher Kristen D. Neff, N-E-F-F, Ph.D. Three things. Be kind in the face of your own suffering. Be nice to yourself. Is especially, being nice to yourself is especially important when you're suffering, feeling inadequate, or are disappointed in yourself. Some people believe that negative self-talk, such as telling yourself, you're such a loser, will somehow motivate them to be better next time. In fact, it does just the opposite. It will somehow motivate them to be worse. Talking to yourself in a positive way during difficult times can make you more resilient and be better able to tackle new goals instead of wallowing in your failures or be able to tackle the denial that you're in. Uh, number two, acknowledge your humanity. Recognize and accept that everyone suffers. It's part of the shared experience of life and of being human. When you understand this, you have less of a tendency to think that you are the only one who faces difficult times. Adopting this viewpoint will help you recognize that you're not alone in your suffering. This will open you up to showing compassion towards others, or this will open you up to asking for help. This will open you up to talking about what you're in denial about. People who want to be kind to themselves, people who have as their goal feeling good, have to tackle those things that make them feel bad. Lee. And so you have to tackle relationship issues. And then the third and last thing, practice mindfulness. Now, we've talked about not mindfulness on this program before. Notice your own suffering. In today's world, it's easy to be a master of distraction, turning to television, music, cell phones, alcohol and drugs, or pastry in my case, to quiet any internal suffering. However, suffering doesn't leave when you put a mask on it or stuff it down beyond your awareness. Being mindful and acknowledging your struggles without judgment allows you to find compassion for yourself and allows you to address the fact that maybe you know better for yourself than your spouse does. Maybe you are the best arbiter of your own happiness. And maybe this thing that you're going into denial about is the thing that if you address it, will give you the best happiness of all. And yes, maybe a lot of life changes are going to take place if you come out of denial that you're in the wrong relationship or there's a lot to correct. But that's okay because it's a new beginning. Coming out of denial gives you a lease on life better than what you've had. So please know that the power of denial can make you live in sadness forever. But if you can turn it around 
if you have compassion for yourself, if you want to give yourself the best life possible and take the chance of addressing it, you will get control back in your life and with control comes happiness. I hope this was helpful to you. I thank you again, as always, for listening. This has been Constructive Uncoupling, the podcast devoted to amicable divorces. You can reach me by going to any of my websites, <laughs> but go ahead to uh, Divorce Resource Incorporated or, or email me, judy at constructiveuncoupling.com. Have a great week. I'll talk to you next time.